This evening, inshallah, we're going to complete the first bundle or even the second bundle of principles. So we said that the very first bundle was principles from the Quran about the cognitive matters, matters of perception, things that the Muslim needs to be aware of well before he or she enters into the marriage. And then we have the second batch of principles, which are the principles from the Quran for the duration of the marriage to ensure that it is flourishing and it is blossoming. We're going to complete the second batch this evening with principle number 10. Then we're going to start the third batch, the penultimate batch, which are principles for the Quran, from the Quran to deal with problems as and when they begin to arise in a marriage. And of course, we will conclude with the fourth batch, which is principles from the Quran post divorce. So principle number 10, this is from the batch of what still we're completing for the flourishing, the blossoming of a marriage. It's where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Ibrahim, وَإِذْ تَأَذَّنَ رَبُّكُمْ لَإِن شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ When your Lord proclaimed that if you are grateful, I am going to increase you. وَلَإِن كَفَرْتُمْ إِنَّ عَذَابِي لَشَدِيدٌ But if you are ungrateful, then indeed my punishment is severe. This, what you just heard, dear brothers and sisters, is a, a metaphysical equation. One that says, where there is gratitude, there will be abundance. And where there is ingratitude, there will be a deficiency. This is a law that is fixed and it is stationary. This law that if you show gratitude, Allah will increase is just as predictable as the rising of the sun is on every single morning. And it is just as fixed as the Newtonian laws of physics that you studied at school. Gratitude equals an increase in things for you to be happy about and to thank Allah for. Ingratitude equals more things for you and I to complain about. And this rule of gratitude equals abundance applies to every one of the walks of life. This is business, financial, this is marital, social at the wider level, it is spiritual, where there is shukr, there is an increase and the opposite is just as true. And this is why I love the words of Imam al-Biqa'i rahimahullah, who said that inna shukra qaydu al mawjudi wa sayyidu al mafqudi he said gratitude is the shackle which you use to chain up what you have and gratitude is the bait that brings you what you don't. Gratitude are the chains, the shackles that protects and preserves what you have. But not just that, he said it is the bait, it's the rod that fetches you the things that you don't have. So you see how valuable a principle this is for a husband and wife in their marital relationship, where there is shukr, mutual gratitude between them. And above that, gratitude to Allah for having one another. What type of flourishing and blossoming this can bring into a marriage. And you find, subhanAllah, that the Quran has given so many promises. But more often than not, these promises of Allah are linked to his Mashiach meaning his divine will. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, for example, يَرْزُقُ مَنْ يَشَاء Allah provides to whomever he wills. Look at how this was connected to his Mashiach. If he wills, he will provide. Allah Almighty, he said, a second example. اللَّهُ لَطِيفٌ بِعِبَادِهِ يَرْزُقُ مَنْ يَشَاء He said, فَسَوْفَ يُغْنِيكُمُ اللَّهُ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ إِنْ شَاءَ Allah will increase you in his bounty if he, if he wills. Again, connected to his what? His Mashiach, his divine will. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said in the context of dua, فَيَكْشِفُ مَا تَدْعُونَ إِلَيْهِ إِنْ شَاءَ He will respond to your dua and he will remove your difficulty if he wills. 
three examples from the Quran that you just heard where Allah is giving is connected to his divine will, if he wills. Yet when he subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about gratitude, there is no connection to his Mashiach. He said, La in shakartum la azidannakum. If you are grateful, I'm going to increase you. And the ayah does not say, if Allah wills. As if to say, it is such a certain guarantee that if you are grateful, Allah will increase you. And there is no need to say, if Allah Almighty wills. And everything, of course, is by the will of Allah. This is a message. However, subhanAllah, it seems that the tendency of the human being is one of lu'um. A nasty bit of work at times. How ingratitude is inculcated, embedded, installed within the human being. It seems to be a human tendency that we will show ingratitude to those people and those things that are nearest to us. Whether that is Allah Jalla Jalaluhu, who is the nearest to us in respect to his knowledge and his favors and his hearing and his seeing. Allah said about us, Inna al-insana la zalumun kafar, man by his nature is unjust. And he is very ungrateful, kafar. And very ungrateful towards our mothers and fathers, the nearest of people, and ungrateful towards our husbands and wives. And perhaps in the relationship of marriage is where we see ingratitude, ingratitude appearing in its most manifest forms. So you will find that in the early years or the early months, let us say, of a marriage, anything that one spouse does to the other is interpreted in the greatest light and praise is lavished. Thank you so much. How could I be living without you? You appreciate your husband, dear sister, in the early parts of your marriage for being that knight in shining, shining armor, bringing home a handsome income each evening. Providing for the house, you appreciate that, you're grateful. But what happens is that with the passage of months and years, all of a sudden, the narrative changes. She starts to say, well, why should I thank him? This is his duty. If he's not providing for me, he's going to be providing for another woman. Ah, ingratitude now begins to, the cancerous roots of ingratitude are beginning to appear in that family. And likewise, a husband may say to his wife, although in the early parts of their marriage, the meal that his new bride cooked for him was the best meal in the world and he was so grateful. Now with the passage of a few years, it's like, why should I be grateful? If you're not cooking for me, you'll be cooking for another man. There's nothing special in that. After all, it's your duty, he will say. Ah, ingratitude. And then issues begin to arise and they go to the therapist and the counselor and they say, it must be Ayn, Sheikh, it must be Hasad, something is affecting the relationship. No, it could be a lot less complicated than that. It could be simply because we have avoided this principle that says what? If you are grateful, Allah says, I will increase you, a promise from Allah Jalla Jalla. And studies have found, this was done by the University of Georgia that those married couple who are grateful to one another have the highest percentage of seeing their marriage survive and thrive. And those who are ungrateful have the greatest tendency to walk away from one another in divorce. Gratitude is a, is a, is a mentality of abundance. It is a bringer of what you don't have and a preserver of what you do. So now the question that poses itself is, how does one express gratitude? How does one unlock this treasure trove of opportunities by being grateful to one's spouse? Imam Ibn Qayyim, he tells us that gratitude to Allah has three pillars. And what we can do is extend those pillars to our relationship with our wives, our husbands. The same three pillars apply. How does one show gratitude to Allah Jalla Jalla? We mentioned it in the Change of Heart series for those of you who are with us. Imam Ibn Al-Qayyim, he says, Ashukuru yakunu bil qalbi khudu'an wa stikanatan wa bil lisani thana'an wa atirafan wa bil jawarihi ta'atan wa anqiyada. He said, gratitude to Allah is shown first of all internally by way of your heart. When it submits, 
and humbles itself to Allah. That's the first pillar of gratitude. It's an internal one. He said, number two, gratitude is verbal by way of what you say, praise and acknowledge the virtues of Allah upon you. And pillar number three, practically by way of submitting and obeying Allah Jalla Jalla. So he says that one who is grateful to Allah, truly shakir li an'umihi, truly thankful to Allah's favors, he's thankful to him internally, he's thank thankful to him verbally, and he's thankful to him practically. Every one of those three is required. And this is a, this is a blessed trinity. And this is an obligation. Now, if you were to extend this trinity, if you were to extend these three pillars to the marital relationship, I say to you, gratitude to your husband or wife is of three pillars. It's the exact same thing. First of all, now we want to put this principle into application. There has to be an internal sense of gratitude to your spouse. If you want Allah to give you the treasures associated with this principle, which is لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ I will give you more. An internal one. What does that mean? It means that deep down inside of you, you're very grateful to have a spouse. You're grateful to be married. Within you, you are so thankful to Allah, first and foremostly, for sending you a spouse who's chosen you over all people. And then you are grateful to your spouse. Uh, the Messenger وسلم, said, as Ibn Hibban narrates, on the authority of Abu Hurairah, that the Prophet وسلم, said, One of you will meet his Lord on the Day of Judgment. له, and Allah will say to him, Alam usakhir lakal khayla wal ibil. Did I not subdue for you horses and camels? Alam tar'as wa tarba'. Did I not give you leadership and positions of authority on the land? And then he says, what? Look at question number three. Did I not marry you to such and such woman? Many men wanted her in marriage. And I prevented them. And I married you to her. So this is the first pillar of gratitude to your spouses internally. You are in acknowledgement to Allah Jalla Jalaluhu that he's given you marriage. And you are in acknowledgement to your spouse for being there for you. So what I'm sharing with you now is not an intellectual exercise. This is not about a theory that needs to be understood. This is about a deep, internal, contemplative conversation you have with yourself where you are genuinely grateful to Allah Jalla Jalaluhu for giving you this individual in your life with their flaws and with their blemishes. And you see our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we quoted his words when he praised Khadija and she had passed away. What do you read in the undertone of his kalam, of his praise? It is thankfulness, it is gratitude for her. When he praised her, what would he say? Amanat bi it kafara bi nas. She believed in me when all others disbelieved. And she said to me, I'm truthful when everyone else said I was a liar. And she gave me from her wealth when everyone else deprived me. And Allah gave me children from her and I have no children from any other wife. What do you read in the undertone of those words? Gratitude to Khadija. So if uh, you are struggling with this and you're not content and you feel that you could have done better and your heart feels it is not grateful, ask yourself a few questions. Perhaps it will change. Is it not such that my wife takes care of my children and cleans my home and tends to my needs? If the answer is yes, then prostrate to Allah in gratitude and say Alhamdulillah because many other men, as you may know, are spending heaps of, of, heaps of money trying to find uh, uh, house cleaners and tutors and child minders to do what your wife is doing free of charge. Dear sister, if your husband, is he not bringing somewhat of a reasonable income, an average income on each evening, each month? If the answer is yes, say Alhamdulillah. 
that Allah has spared you the burden of needing to fend for yourself and you are spared from the day-to-day -day anxieties of work and the anxiety of an unknown future and you've been blessed with the stability of marriage, say Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. Is it not my brother, my sister that your spouse tries her best religiously with her flaws, with his flaws, they pray five times a day, say Alhamdulillah because your neighbor is complaining of a spouse who's refusing to pray. You have so much to be grateful about. What is the opposite of this? The opposite of what? Of having internal gratitude, feeling it inside before we talk about the other two pillars. The opposite of this is discontentment. Always comparing your spouse with others. Always feeling that you could have somehow pulled someone far prettier, far taller, darker and more handsome. Someone far richer than your husband, far more beautiful than your wife. This person will never be satisfied. Because as they say that gratitude is something which if you use, that which is with you will increase. And when you don't have gratitude, nothing will ever be enough. And shaitan is always whispering to the ingrate, the kafir, the ingrate, saying to him or her, the grass is always greener on the other side. You have no idea what you've missed out on. La wallahi, the one who is ungrateful to Allah, and ungrateful to their spouse, the grass will never be greener for them on any side. And this is a fact. Allah Jalla Jalaluhu, he says, وَلَا تَتَمَنَّوا مَا فَضَّلَ اللَّهُ بِهِ بَعْضَكُمْ عَلَىٰ بَعْضٍ don't wish for the things that Allah has preferred some of you over others. Don't long for them. And look at the ones who are beneath you. Don't look at those who are above you because that will help you not belittle the favor of Allah upon you. So this is the pillar number what? Number one, the idea of ashukru yakunu bil qalbi, the internal sense of gratitude that you're really grateful to Allah that you are married to a Muslim or a Muslima with their faults and their blemishes. You are married. You now have an outlet. Think of your brothers and sisters who do not. Think of a time when your only companion were the whisperings of shaitan and you remember where that takes, where that took you and where it takes people. Alhamdulillah. The second pillar we said is the verbal shukr. وَالشُّكْرُ يَكُونُ بِاللِّسَانِ ثَنَاءً وَاعْتِرَافًا The verbal sense of gratitude to say to this individual from time to time, I am grateful for you. Jazakillahu khairan. Barakallahu feek for what you provide and the value you add to this family. Well, we couldn't do it without you after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And see, it is very sad when this pillar of gratitude, speaking about it, is only mentioned in a counseling session. When husband and wife, they're now speaking to a sheikh about their problems and the brother or the sister will say to their spouse, but you know, honey, that I love you. You know that I'm so grateful. She says, now you're saying it? You haven't said that for years. Why in this session? People want to hear it. In fact, if Allah, Jalla Jalaluhu, who knows what is inside of you, you may be the most grateful Muslim in the world to him. He knows what is inside of you, yet he wants to hear you praise him. What then of human beings? What then of weak and meek, deficient human beings like us? We want to hear it. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ said, مَنْ صُنِعَ إِلَيْهِ مَعْرُوفٌ فَقَالَ جَزَاكَ اللَّهُ خَيْرًا فَقَدْ أَبْلَغَ فِي الثَّنَاءِ The hadith of Usama ibn Zayd. Whoever has a favor done for him, and then he says, look, he says, جَزَاكَ اللَّهُ خَيْرًا expresses gratitude, then you've given full praise. You have given full praise when you say, جَزَاكَ اللَّهُ خَيْرًا. You've reciprocated the favor. The idea is that it needs to be what? It needs to be expressed verbally. Don't be stingy. It doesn't cost anything, but it adds unlimited value to a relationship. In fact, when a man was with the Prophet وسلم, and he saw another Sahabi walking by and he said, Messenger of Allah, I love that man over there. He said to him, did you ever tell him? He said, no. He said, go and tell him. So he went and he said to the man, I love you for the sake of Allah. And the man said, I too love you for the sake of him whom you loved before. Express it. The opposite of this is what? The opposite of this is never expressing it. And here you have an issue. 
And that's why the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said about the ungrateful spouse, he said, لا ينظر الله إلى امرأة لا تشكر لزوجها وهي لا تستغني عنه The hadith of Al-Hakim on the authority of Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As Allah does not look at a woman Allah does not look at a woman who does not express her gratitude to her husband while she cannot do without him The idea of expressing gratitude is not enough to say she should know I mean I'm working 9 till 5 every day for who? I'm paying the bills for who? I'm bringing in the shopping for who? Jazakallah khair. This is the practical gratitude. We'll speak about that in a moment, but people need to hear it. And in the hadith of Al-Bukhari on the authority of Ibn Abbas, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Uritu anna ra'tha idha akhtharu ahliha an nisa'u yakfurna. He said, I was shown the hellfire. And I saw that the majority of its inhabitants were women. And that is because they engage in a lot of kufr. And kufr, as you know, can be translated or understood as rejection of Allah. Or it can be understood as being ungrateful. And he meant here the latter meaning. And that's why the women, when they heard this, they said, Yakfurna billah, Messenger of Allah. Do you mean that people disbelieve in Allah? We women, we are disbelieving in Allah? He said, no. يَكْفُرْنَا الْعَشِيرَ وَيَكْفُرْنَا الْإِحْسَانَ لَوْ أَحْسَنْتَ إِلَىٰ إِحْدَاهُنَّ الدَّهْرَ ثُمَّ رَأَتْ مِنْكَ شَيْئًا قَالَتْ مَا رَأَيْتُ مِنْكَ خَيْرًا قَدْ He said, no, what I mean by this is that they're ungrateful to their husbands and they are ungrateful to his favors. He said, he said, he may do a lifetime's worth of good to her, but if he makes one mistake, she will turn around and say to him, you've never done anything good for me. And this is the hadith. After a lifetime's worth of goodness, you may make one mistake and she will say, you have never done any good for me. So the opposite of expressing gratitude is this, and look at where it can land a Muslim man or a Muslim woman. So we said pillar number one is the idea of the internal sense of gratitude, that you feel it inside. Number two, it is a, a verbal manifestation of shukr. You express it. Jazakillahu khayran, barakallahu feek. You speak about it. This is proven to improve the quality of a marriage. And number three, one of the most important dimensions is the practical aspect of shukr, gratitude to one another. Practical gratitude. The first is useless. The second is useless if that third pillar is missing. How many times have couples have said, I don't care if you are grateful inside of you, if you feel grateful. I don't care if you tell me how much you love me and how grateful you are to me as a husband or wife. What I care is about what money talks, right? Actions speak louder than words. Walk the walk. Where is it? The practical gratitude. And practical gratitude could be, for example, sharing the burdens of one another, the burdens of life. A husband who helps around in the, in the house. A wife who is reasonable in her request from her husband. Gifts that they give to one another. These are examples of practical gratitude. And perhaps one of the most obvious manifestations of practical gratitude in the marital world is the element of faithfulness. To avoid infidelity. To keep your gaze lowered. And to keep your affection shared with one individual and one alone. Especially when it is outside of the department of that which is halal. A person who is unfaithful to his or her spouse, at the core of what they are doing, is screaming out to the world and saying, I am ungrateful for the ni'mah of the righteous or the permissible spouse that Allah has gifted me with. I am discontent with his favor. I will look elsewhere. And that's why Makhlad ibn al-Husayn, one of our predecessors, he said, when defining a shukr, he said, Kana yuqalu inna shukran ni'mati tarkul ma'asi. He said that people used to say, gratitude is the avoidance of sins. He said, if you're looking for a definition of gratitude, shukr, it is the avoidance of sins. So in the language of marriage, it is gratitude. It, it is the avoidance of what destroys a marriage and what destroys a marriage more than infidelity and being unfaithful. And such an individual has forgotten that the principle we are studying now, 
لَإِنْ شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ If you show gratitude, I will increase you. He has forgotten that he has a second half. وَلَإِنْ كَفَرْتُمْ إِنَّ عَذَابِ لَشَدِيدٌ But if you are ungrateful, my punishment is severe. Ah, and now that he has become or she has become an unfaithful spouse, they are now tasting the bitter consequence of this latter half of the principle. They are seeing now the punishment of being ungrateful. They all complain of the same thing. May Allah pardon them all and pardon us. They see what it means now when the punishment of Allah arrives for not being fully grateful for this ni'mah. They see now a, a, a dysfunctional family because the gaze has been wandering around and affection has been shared with others and kind and romantic words has extended beyond the permissible spouse. And now their family comes crumbling down when it is discovered. Dysfunctional family. Inna adabi la shadeed. Allah said, My punishment is severe for the ungrateful ones. Children who now experience the full force of their parents' infidelity and the trauma when they feel that mom and dad have exchanged us for another set of children. They grow up confused and unaware. And then huge financial repercussions traveling from area to area, city to city, because kids are not with you anymore or legal settlements, or their likes. And then you have that cancerous sore of regret that cripples you for ill and poor choices you made in your life. And then you see the trust that has been demolished in the life of your wife or husband that is very difficult to repair, and rarely is it repaired. Because in th these things, in most cases, we only have one chance. And you begin to experience these pains, these anguishes that keep you up at night because of these ill decisions. And you remember, la ilaha illallah, how valuable your spouse was, how beautiful the good old days were. You remember how grateful you should have been. Now you realize how valuable your spouse was. But guess what? It's a little bit too late now. It's a little bit too late. Allah said, in kafartum, if you are ungrateful, in adabi la shadeed, my punishment is severe. And Allah Jalla Jalaluhu said, وَضَرَبَ اللَّهُ مَثَلًا قَرِيَةً Allah has given the example of a city. آمِنَةً مُطْمَئِنَّةً It was safe and secure. MashaAllah. يَأْتِيهَا رِزْغُهَا رَغَدًا مِنْ كُلِّ مَكَانٍ Its provisions were coming to it abundantly from all places. What happened? فَكَفَرَتْ بِأَنْعُمِ اللَّهِ But it became ungrateful towards the favors of Allah. So what happened? فَأَذَاقَهَا اللَّهُ لِبَاسَ الْجُوعِ وَالْخَوْفِ بِمَا كَانُوا يَصْنَعُونَ So Allah made that city taste the extremes of hunger and fear because of what they used to do. Many husbands and wives were like this. In a beautiful relationship, their provision coming to them from all places, physically, spiritually, in terms of food and drink, in terms of finances, security, agreement, it was all in place. But one of them was ungrateful to the favor of Allah. And they began to knock on the doubtful doors. And Allah made them taste the extremes of hunger or thirst or poverty or fear or insecurity or depression or anguish or their likes because of what they used to do. So brothers and sisters, if we are grateful to Allah Jalla Jalaluhu and then to our spouses, Allah has promised an increase. Please realize that the pursuit for happiness and individual pleasure has become in the 21st century like a god that is worshipped. It's become like an idol. The pursuit of happiness is a religion today. And it's bringing a greater burden than it is liberation and happiness. This is the reality. And rather now talking about what you can give, the idea is about what you can receive, what the government, what people, what your family, what your spouse can do for you. The sense of entitlement is phenomenal. And that's why there's everyone, everyone's talking about human rights, but rarely, rarely will you find someone talking about human responsibilities. They have placed the philosophies of the 21st century, they have placed the human being at the center of the universe. Everything must serve him. Everything has to, is about happiness and your individual satisfaction. Nothing else matters. And what happens as a result of this, you are now running after a worldly, earthly utopia that is untainable and uh, Allah has been sidelined and that creates a void in the heart 
And that void is crippling to gratitude. It's crippling to shukur. And there is really no better secret that can put a therapist and a counselor out of business better than the secret of gratitude. With it, we will not need any of these professionals. So if you are grateful, Allah has promised an increase. And I hope you see how valuable this is in the world of marriage. This is the end of the second batch of principles, which we said were principles for the duration of a marriage when things are going well. Now we move on to principle 11. This is introducing a new batch. These are principles we're going to deal with from the Quran for when the boat of marriage begins to rock. When issues begin to arise. And I share with you principle 11, the first of these principles from this third batch. And this is where Allah Jalla Jalaluhu said in Surah 66 of the Quran, عَرَّفَ بَعْضَهُ وَأَعْرَضَ عَنْ بَعْضَ He, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, made some of it known and he overlooked other parts. What does that mean? There was a problem that happened between the Prophet Alaihi Salatu Wasallam and some of his wives. And so when he addressed the problem, and he was not to blame. Allah said, commenting on the behavior of the Prophet ﷺ, Allah said that he made some of it known, meaning he told them about some of his grievances and the things that they did. But he overlooked other parts. In other words, he did not give them a full report of all of their downfalls. He mentioned some and he overlooked other parts. And the key word here is what? He overlooked some parts. There is a concept in our religion known as at taghaful at taghaful you can translate it as overlooking. You can translate it as artificial unawareness. Or you can translate it as feigning ignorance. Pretending to be unaware of a matter. Being in a relationship where there is constant criticism over every minor and major micro matter is very annoying and suffocating. And that criticism can take the form of critique, um, course correction, frowning, editing, um, whatever it may be, whatever you do, there is a sense of editorial commentary that's happening everything you do seems to be wrong and this is very agitating for a spouse. Allah said about the Prophet alayhi wasalam, he made known some of it but he overlooked, he overlooked other parts. And John Gottman who's a couples researcher he said that nitpicking is a huge predictor of marital failure. When one or the other is constantly blaming, constantly criticizing, constantly pointing out the blemishes, more often than not, this relationship will fail, Mr. Gottman, he said. So what is this idea of overlooking, or we're calling it taghafl? I'm going to give you a definition and try to memorize it. The scholars, they say, at taghafl huwa takalluful ghaflati. It is to feign ignorance. It is to act as if you are unaware. Whilst being fully aware of what it is that you're overlooking. So why do you do it? The definition says, Because of an inner sense of nobility that causes you to rise above petty matters. Did you get the definition? They say, Al taghafl is to feign ignorance whilst being fully aware of what it is that you're turning a blind eye to. And that is due to a sense of inner nobility that causes you to rise above petty matters. I think that it is very difficult to sustain a long-term marriage without this principle of learning how to Focus on the war, even if it means you have to lose a few battles along the way. It is key. And that's why you find it exhibited in the life of the Prophet 
of Salatu was Salam. Is it not that they used to curse him? They did. And they used to call him Mudhamman. His name is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the praised one. They would call him Mudhamman, meaning the reviled one, the despised one, God forbid. But what would he say? Sahih al-Bukhari, he would say, أَلَا تَعْجَبُونَ كَيْفَ يَصْرِفُ اللَّهُ عَنِّي شَتْمَ قُرَيْشٍ وَلَعْنَهُمْ He said to his companions, don't you find it amazing how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala averts from me the cursing and swearing of Quraysh? يَشْتُمُونَ مُذَمَّمًا وَيَلْعَنُونَ مُذَمَّمًا وَأَنَا مُحَمَّدٌ They're cursing and swearing a man called Mudhammam, but my name is Muhammad. So why should I be offended? They're cursing a different man. Now my question to you, brothers and sisters, was he not aware, alayhi salatu wasalam, that you were intended? Was he not aware that when they said Mudhammam, they were speaking about him? Of course he was aware. But this is what we are speaking about here. This idea of taghafal, this idea of overlooking, this idea of keeping your eyes on the macro, the bigger picture. And you, my brother, as a leader of your family, this is required from you in higher dosages than even your spouse. This is expected from a leader to be, not be nitpicking and to not want to get the, his way in every single argument and discussion, but understands that sometimes I will have to forsake some of my rights whilst ensuring that I am giving the full rights that other people deserve. This is the element of taghafal. It is a noble characteristic. It's an honorable trait. And you find, you remember the hadith of Umm Zara that we spoke about when our mother Aisha, she said that there were 11 women who came to her home and they said that we're going to speak about our husbands and we're not going to hide any detail whatsoever. And each one of the 11 women spoke. And then the 11th one said that my husband Abu Zara did this, that and the other. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to Aisha that I was like Abu Zara to Umm Zara to you, but I will, I will not divorce you. The interesting thing is a description of woman number five from the 11. What did she say about her husband praising him? She said, Zawji, إِذَا دَخَلَ فَهِدْ وَإِذَا خَرَجَ أَسِدْ وَلَا يَسْأَلُ عَمَّا عَهِدْ she said that my husband, when he comes into the house, he's like a leopard. But when he leaves the house, he's like a lion. And when he returns home, he does not ask me about anything about the house. What does she mean? It's obvious. When she says he goes out of the house, he's like a lion, meaning he's brave. And when he comes into the house, he doesn't ask about any of the house matters, meaning la yukhawinuha. He doesn't accuse her or does not have faith in her. He does not distrust her. He doesn't ask about anything. He fully trusts her. And the first description he said when he comes into the home, he's like a leopard. The scholars of hadith, they said, what, is, what she is saying is that my husband, he is a man who engages in taghafal. He overlooks matters. Because the leopard, by his nature, he is sleepy. He's always sleeping. And one who is asleep is inattentive. So she is saying that my husband is like the leopard when he comes home, meaning he's inattentive, he sleeps a lot. What she means by that as a metaphor, that he does not focus on my faults. He's purposely ignoring my mistakes. And that is a praiseworthy characteristic in a human being. And no marriage can survive without it. And Al-Hasan al-Basri, he said, Mastaqsa Karimun Qat. No honorable man seeks to receive all of his rights in full. La ya akhi. There will be elements of your rights as a husband, and of course as a wife, that will not be fulfilled in full by your spouse. An honorable person is one who learns how to feign ignorance and looks at the bigger picture and says, most of the things are well, so we can move on. And when a man called Uthman ibn Za'idah, he said, Al-'afiyatu asharatu ajza' tis'atun minha fi taghafal Uthman ibn Za'idah, he said that well-being, being well, is of ten parts. Nine parts of it is in being able to overlook. Yeah, your your well-being, your afia, your happiness will come, 90% he is saying, from your ability to overlook things that bother you. Imam Ahmed, when he heard this, he said, no, no, no. Al-'afiyatu asharatu ajza' kulluha fi taghafal 
Ahmed said, Afia, well-being is ten parts. All ten parts are in taghafun, the idea of overlooking. And that is expected from you, as I said, as a brother, more than anyone else. And this is how we understand the ayah in the Quran where Allah said, وَلِلْرِجَالِ عَلَيْهِنَّ دَرَجَةً That men have a degree over them. Men have a degree over them. What is meant by this degree that they have over women? Ah, Ibn Jarir al-Tabari, he said that the strongest opinion, in my opinion, with respect to this ayah is what Abdullah ibn Abbas, he said, who said that this is the ability of a man to overlook some of his rights in marriage and to accept lesser of a deal whilst giving his full rights to his spouse. That's the behavior of a noble individual and that's the behavior of a, of a leader. If you want to put this principle into practice, the idea of learning how to not be a nitpicker, what do you do? I'll give you three steps before we conclude. First thing, if you are a nitpicker, you're constantly nitpicking everything about your wife or husband, their dress or their uh, appearance or their ibadah or their spirituality or their cooking or their working or if you're on constantly commenting about something, the first thing you need to do is ask yourself the question, where is this coming from? Why am I like this? This could be for several reasons and each reason has its own treatment. It could be because this is how your parents treated you. They were constantly criticizing you. And now ch childhood is catching up with adulthood. It could be because you are calling for attention. Sometimes this nitpicking is a scream for attention. Sometimes it's because um, you've got nothing better to do. You just need to busy yourself with something else so that you stop focusing on these unnecessary details that's ruining the marriage. Sometimes this nitpicking is because of resentment. There's a bigger problem in a relationship and it's appearing in the form of nitpicking. So that's the first thing, an internal conversation. Why am I like this? Where is it coming from? And treat it accordingly. Number two, before you nitpick, before you focus on the detail, pause, breathe, reflect. Do I need to speak? Am I focusing on the rose of a situation or am I just focusing on the thorns? If you're focusing on the thorns, the negative of a situation, then ask yourself the question, how important is it in the grand scheme of things? And if it is like someone who's turning off water when there is a fire in the house, I say to you, yes, involve yourself. Otherwise, you will probably need to overlook it and keep your criticism to yourself. That's number two. Think before you speak. Number three, if you decide that I do need to nitpick or I do need to say something, then perhaps employ what they call in the world of business the sandwich approach. This is something that business professionals are speaking about nowadays and touting it. The idea of sandwiching a neg negative criticism in two layers of praise. So it looks something like this, that you are so good at such and such, you're wonderful, you're brilliant. And by the way, this could be improved here and there and the other, but by the way, you are wonderful and great. They call it the sandwich approach. These are three suggestions for those who are studying or are struggling with this principle that says عَرَّفَ بَعْضَهُ وَعَرَضَ عَنْ بَعْضَ He uh, made known some of it and he overlooked other parts. Brothers and sisters, in conclusion to this principle, there will be situations in your marriage that are simply unsolvable. There is no fix for it. If you want to be married, you're going to have to accept that there are certain battles that you are going to lose. And if you are a wise spouse, you will accept to lose a few, a few of those battles so that you can win the war. And just by virtue of people coming together from different backgrounds, different cultures, different acceptabilities, different experiences in life, there's going to be a clash. And therefore, if you're always trying to fix it, you're going to have an issue Rather, there is a shift that needs to be made. Rather than seeing my problem as a problem that needs a solution, no, I shift it and I think about it as a challenge that requires management. However, if you are constantly nitpicking, what you will find is that your spouse will begin to hate your advice that comes from you. You say, I just want to help you. She says, I don't want your help. It's not because she doesn't need it, it's because she's resenting it because it's coming from you and you in her eyes or his eyes, you've become a nitpicker. 
Ah, so being this nitpicker who does not know how to overlook is a very low social intelligence move. And it's a very quick way to remove from you, sister, your attractiveness and your appeal from the eyes of your husband. And it's a very quick way, my brother, to demolish your charisma and leadership in a relationship. When you don't know how to overlook certain petty matters that do not affect the grand scheme of your relationship. These are two principles we've covered today. Principle 10, your Lord has proclaimed that if you are, you are grateful, he will increase you. And principle 11, where Allah says, he made known some of it. And he ignored, he overlooked other parts.